The next question we have comes from, it's a super chat, Nathaniel Stallings. Nathaniel Stallings, that's a great name. Uh, I struggle with doubt. I still believe in the gospel, but I've been getting a lot of questions about things such as inerrancy that I am uncertain about. Do you have any helpful words for someone struggling with doubt, particularly regarding inerrancy? Okay, so for our listeners, thank you, Nathaniel, for writing in. Uh, inerrancy is uh, simply refu- uh, referring to a, um, a view of the scripture, uh, that the scripture is inerrant. Um, meaning that it, it does not err. It, it contains no errors. Inerrancy and infallibility are often used interchangeably, although uh, you could maybe debate the issue about some distinctions, but by and large, in general, um, inerrancy is infallibility. So the Bible um, being infallible. Um, as it pertains to sola scriptura, Right, so you have the five solas that came out of the Reformation, uh, sola scriptura, you have soli fide, uh, you have sola gratia, you have uh, soli de, uh, deo gloria, uh, and then you also have um, sola Christus, solis Christus. Um, basically, you have you know scripture alone. It's all alone. Sola is just the Latin word for alone. And so you have scripture alone, uh, glory to God alone, Christ alone, grace alone, faith alone. And so sola scriptura is probably um, a doctrine that many of our listeners are familiar with. I'm sure you're familiar with that as well, Nathaniel. Um, one of the things though I think people miss about sola scriptura is um, they, they sometimes think that, that it means that scripture is the only authority. So only scripture or scripture alone. Uh, that doesn't mean scripture is alone, meaning that it's the only authority. It means that scripture is the only infallible authority. So there are other authorities. How do we know that there are other authorities? Well, ironically, because of scripture. Scripture tells us that God has other authorities. Uh, we have civil magistrates that have some measure of authority. A father and mother in their home with their children have authority. A husband over his wife has a measure of authority. Pastors, elders in a church setting have authority. Your boss in the workplace has authority. So there are other um, legitimate, God-given authorities. Um, but the distinction is that every other authority here on earth um, is not infallible. Every other authority here on earth can err. They can be wrong. Uh, so scripture is not the only authority, but it is two things. It's the only infallible authority, and it's the highest authority. So it's the only infallible authority, and it is the highest authority. And so the doctrine of sola scriptura, as well as the inerrancy of scripture, go hand in hand, saying that scripture is the only infallible authority. It is, in fact, inerrant. It never errs. Um, and it is also the highest authority. So somebody who is wrestling with doubts in regards to the credibility, that's what you're ultimately expressing. I'm struggling with the validity of scripture, the credibility of scripture. How do I know that the scripture is without error? How do I know that the scripture is trustworthy? And you'll get a lot of opinions on this because ultimately what we're talking about is apologetics a defense for the faith. And one of the things that, you know, that falls underneath the purview of apologetics is the authority of scripture. And wrapped up in the authority of scripture is the reliability of the scripture, right? It's inerrancy. And so you've got guys like Sproul, again, to use him as an example, he would be um, a classical apologist, or he would have been when he was alive. He was a classical apologist. And there's some distinctions between, you know, classic apologetics and evidential apologetics, um, but there are a lot of similarities. So those would both be similar in a category, evidential apolo uh, apologist, apologetics, and classical apologetics. Um, I personally would, would be on the side of guys like uh, Jeff Durbin, James White, um, who are really just products of guys like Greg Bonson, who was discipled and is a product of Cornelius Van Til. Um, Cornelius Van Til is a product of Gehardus Voss. Um, and so we would be in the, in the realm of presuppositional apologetics. And there's a lot that can be said about presuppositional apologetics. Um, but suffice it to say this, what the presuppositionalist wants to do, or rather what they want to not do, what they want to avoid, is they don't want to put any authority, 
right? So scripture is the highest authority, sola scriptura. They want to be true to the heart of sola scriptura. A presuppositional apologist wants to be faithful to the principle of sola scriptura, that scripture is not the only authority, but it's the highest authority. And so what the presuppositionalist wants to do is they don't ever want to put the authority of scripture, which is meant to be the highest authority, and have it hinge or rest upon, be dependent on a lesser authority. And that's ultimately, I believe, what classical apologetics and evidential apologetics does. So guys like William Lane Craig, I'm personally not a big fan. I think there are some points that he makes that are fine. Um, but I think that William Lane, Lane Craig uh, has some big problems in the realm of apologetics and then much bigger problems, I think, you know, in other arenas outside of apologetics, like his uh, molism, uh, mol Molinism um, instead of Calvinism and trying to basically tote the line between Arminianism and Calvinism. God is sovereign, but not really. And you can watch his debate with uh, James White on that. And it's really insightful. So, but guys like, I, I use his name because he's probably one of the most known, you know, evidential or classical apologists. He's really more of an evidential guy. Uh, R.C. Sproul was more classical, but there's a lot of similarities. And in a nutshell, it's this. Um, they're going to try to build your faith in the reliability of the Bible by using some other authority outside of the Bible as, as the credible voice. So how do we know that the Bible is true? Well, we know that the Bible is true because of the resurrection, right? So they'll get into, well, the reliability of the res resurrection. So to answer the question about the reliability of the Bible, they'll go to the reliability of, you know, proof for the resurrection. So then they'll try to say, well, we have enough eyewitnesses and we have these other extra biblical accounts, whether it be, you know, the, the Jewish historian um, Josephus, you know, and extra biblical accounts of other people who wrote in, did this and did that. And then just logical conclusions that we can come to with this and with that, that prove that Jesus rose from the dead, all right? Well, if Jesus rose from the dead, that's a supernatural event, right? That nobody rises from the dead um, naturally. That is a supernatural event, which means that, that God, a supernatural God, had to to raise him from the dead. And well, now let's look at the teaching of Jesus, right? Now that we've established that he really did rise from the dead, bodily rise from the dead. Uh, he really did die. He really was dead and he really did rise. Uh, well, that's supernatural. Only God could have done that. Uh, now, what, what did Jesus say in his teaching? Well, Jesus claimed to be God. And so you look at the text, you know, in the, in the gospel narratives where Jesus claimed to be God. And so then basically you make the logical argument of, well, uh, would God... God the Father raised Jesus from the dead if he was a false prophet, if he made claims about himself, namely him being God's son, him being equal with the Father, him being divine, uh, would God the Father raise a false prophet from the dead, validating his false prophecies? So that's the logical argument is, well, first let's prove that Jesus rose from the dead. If we can prove, prove that, then that proves that Jesus is in fact the son of God because Rising from the dead is a supernatural event. Supernatural event can only occur if the supernatural God causes it to occur. And God would not do that um, for somebody who made false blasphemous claims. God's not going to raise a blasphemer from the dead, therefore validating his blasphemy. So all the things that Jesus said about himself must be true, namely that he is the son of God. Uh, if he's the son of God, then he is God um, himself. He is God and therefore he is authoritative. And so everything else he says, must be true. Okay, now we look at what did Jesus say about the Bible, right? And so he said, well, what did he say about the Old Testament? Not, not one jot or tittle will pass away, right? He, Jesus affirms with his disciples, he affirms uh, the validity, the credibility, the inerrancy of the Old Testament, um, the Torah, and says, this is the word of God. Um, and then Jesus commissions, so with his authority as God himself, the son of God, he, uh, he affirms the, the credibility of the Old Testament. And so that's going back. And in terms of going forward, Jesus, with his authority as God, the son of God, he commissions the apostles and endows them with authority. He grants them authority, apostolic authority to speak on his behalf. And so basically we have the Old and New Testament. We have Jesus granting authority to the writers of the New Testament and Jesus validating uh, the credibility of the Old Testament. And Jesus himself um, is credible because he is God. And how do we know that he's God? Well, because he claimed to be God. And 
Um, his claims to be God, we can trust are true because no one who claimed to be God falsely uh, would be validated by God the Father uh, through resurrection. So what you're doing is you're, you're, you're taking the credibility of the Bible and you're hinging it on ultimately, logically, in succession, the credibility of the resurrection. And that's not the worst thing in the world, although I do have problems with that. That gets you to guys like Andy Stanley. Right? Andy Stanley, like, we should unhitch the Old Testament from the New Testament. No, we, we should not. <laughs> you know, and, and, and he you know, would make arguments about, well, it's, the resurrection is what really matters. Jesus is what really matters. And the Bible, you know, we, can, we can kind of stop being so defensive about the credibility of the Bible. That's, that's insanity. And I don't have time to get into all that. But, um, so there are problems with hinging the reliability of the Bible on the reliability of the resurrection. There are problems with that. Um, but there are really big problems in my assessment, as much as I, got, I like guys like R.C. Sproul, uh, there are really big problems when you hinge the reliability, the inerrancy of the Bible on the proof of the resurrection. And then, well, how do, how do you prove the resurrection? Uh, that's all the way back to the first thing that I said. You then hinge the proof of the resurrection on extra biblical sources, whether it be um, early Jewish historians like Josephus, or whether it be archaeologists and their reports, or whether it be this, or whether it be that. Um, so what are you doing? Essentially, the principle is this. What you're doing is you're taking people's faith in the Word of God, um, and you're saying, this is the authority. The Word of God is authoritative. And in order for you to believe that it's authoritative, in order for it to be authoritative, it is resting on a lesser authority, the authority of Josephus the authority of this archaeologist and what they said, and this archaeologist who found the tomb, but there were no bones inside. Like, and so, so ultimately, your, your faith in the word, so then what happens, my point is, what happens if we find some other scroll from Josephus that contradicts everything that he previously said? What happens if all of a sudden some archaeologist claims to have found the bones of Jesus? Oh, we found the tomb, and oh, there are bones inside, and we can, you know, car carbon date them, you know, and say, oh, this is... Now, I would look at that, and i just laugh. Like, people ask, like, you know, I've heard people ask that question. Like, if, if the bones of Jesus were discovered or claimed to be discovered with, you know, reliable evidence, would that cause you to doubt your faith? And the answer for me is absolutely not. Absolutely not. I mean, what, basically you're saying, uh, what if the science pointed in a contradicting direction to the Bible? Well, okay, I've, I've seen how science works these last two years, right? I, I'm familiar with the WHO. I'm familiar with the CDC. I'm familiar with uh, His, His Highness, Dr. Fauci. I'm, I'm familiar with, you know, come on, get real. Uh, I believe in science. I'm a Christian. Faith and science are not at odds. Uh, but there's a difference between actual science and the science that comes from pagans who are constantly trying to disprove God, uh, not because it's actually scientific, uh, because it's not a matter of the intellect. It's a matter of morals. It's a moral issue. They're trying to disprove God, not because they're following the science and where it actually leads without bias. No, they're, they're, they're trying to prove that God doesn't exist because they hate God. They hate God. So I don't want the reliability, the inerrancy of Scripture to rest, the authority of Scripture itself to rest on a lesser, fallible authority. Sola Scriptura. Scripture is the highest authority, and it's the only perfect, unerring, infallible authority. So I, I personally think that classic, classical apologetics and, and evidential apologetics is... Um, logically, if you follow the logic, it's a denial of sola scriptura. And I'm reformed. I'm reformed. I am classically reformed, traditionally reformed. So because I am reformed, I hold to the solas. And because I hold to the solas, including sola scriptura, um, logically, theologically, that forces me to be a presuppositional apologist. And a presuppositional apologist, I'll end with this, would say, why is the Bible the word of God? How can we, what, what is the, the proof for the reliability of the Bible, that it's inerrant? Um, the Bible is trustworthy because the Bible says so. And I know that you may not like that, Nathaniel, and I know that there will be many, even those who are Christians, like R.C. Sproul, who would say that's circular logic. 
I would encourage you, if you really want more on this particular topic, um, look at John Frame, his book on apologetics and what he says in particular on circular logic. He, he addresses at great length um, the idea, the claim, the accusation of circular logic when it comes to presuppositional apologetics, ultimately saying that the Bible is valid because the Bible says so. Uh, but what I'm saying is that although that may be an apparent paradox, what we would call an apparent paradox or an apparent cir circular logic, um, it's not. It's not circular logic. It's not a fallacy. It is not a logical fallacy. It appears to be a logical fallacy, but what I wanted, the reason why I went to such great lengths is because what I wanted you to see before I presented what I think the answer to your question is, how, do I, how can I trust the Bible? Because the Bible says I can trust the Bible, right? I, I, because I know that there are on the surface, problems with that answer or appear to be problems with that answer. That's why I wanted to first show you at great lengths the only alternative. The only alternative that may sound more logical is that the authority of the Bible rests on a lesser authority. And as Christians, that, that just that blatantly contradicts everything that we say we believe. We don't trust God because a lesser authority tells us that we can trust God. I mean, that gets us all the way back to Genesis 1, 2, and 3, right? Where, where Satan, a creature, a lesser authority, says, did God really say? Like, can you really take God at his word? That lesser authorities, what, what they ultimately do, because lesser authority, not only are they lesser in degree, uh, but they're also lesser in terms of purity, right? The Bible is it's not just the highest authority, it's the only infallible authority. Other authorities err. Other authorities um, are sinful. And that doesn't mean that, that, you know, so we shouldn't have pastors, right? Like, no, but, but they are sinful. Pastors make mistakes. I make mistakes. Um, and so, no, I don't want the authority of God's word to be dependent, contingent on a lesser and, and fallible authority. Uh, you know, I think of the children's song. I, I sing this to my girls. Um, I, I sing it, you know, not all the time, but I, I sang it just uh, two nights ago to my oldest daughter, Olive. And uh, it was bedtime. And I was answering one of her questions and doing some catechism with her, catechizing. And uh, she was basically asking the question, how do I know that Jesus loves me? You know, and I sang the song, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's it. How do I know that Jesus loves me? Because I had a personal, mystical, spiritual experience with Jesus. No. How do I know that Jesus loves me? Uh, because my pastor told no. How do I know that Jesus loves Because the Bible told me so. That's it. That's the only infallible source. Everything else can be tested, tried, and found wanting. Everything else can have holes poked in it. Everything else is a lesser authority and an erring authority, a fallible authority. Uh, the only authority that we can really trust is the Bible. How do you know Jesus loves you? Um, because the Bible says so. Well, how do I know that the Bible is the word of God? Because the Bible says so. Because the Bible says so. I would encourage you also to uh, take time. I don't have to, uh, time to go into it, but look at the 1689 and the Westminster Confession of Faith, namely um, the particular articles that deal with the Word of God. It's the first chapter, I believe, in the, uh, the London Baptist 1689 Confession of Faith. First chapter, there are, I think, seven paragraphs or close to it about the Word of God. And one of the paragraphs addresses this very question. How do I know that the Bible is the Word of God? And it gives multiple answers um, it says, well, the loftiness of its language, the majesty of its language, I believe is the language that's used. Um, it's beautiful. It's, uh, you know, or, or this or that, or, or many things that it says have, have been, uh, many things that the Bible predicts have come to pass, you know, this, uh, but then it, then it ultimately gets to the heart and says, but the number one reason I'm paraphrasing the number one reason that we can trust that the Bible is the word of God is because of the inward witness of the Holy spirit that testifies within us that this is God's word. So I, I would say, trust the Bible because the Bible says it's trustworthy and ask the spirit of God to give you faith, to fan into flame your faith. Um, because it sounds like what you're saying, wrestling with doubts, there's a difference between doubt and unbelief. Um, if, if that's true, that, that what you're wrestling with is doubt, 
then, then that means that, that there's at least a part of you that has faith. And, and so, no, you don't have robust, full, mature faith that you would like, um, but you have some faith. So what do we do? What do we do as Christians with some faith? What do we do when we have a little faith? Um, well, we pray that God would increase it. And, and <laughs> this goes back to what is an apparent paradox, what seems to be circular logic, but what does the Bible say about faith and how it grows? Well, the Bible says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word the word of Christ, the word of God. So how do I grow in my faith that the Bible is the word of God? I read more of the Bible because faith comes by hearing the word of God. I think if you just, if you look for outside sources to tell you that the Bible is credible, um, ultimately you'll come up dry. But if you look to the Bible to have a bolstered faith in the Bible, uh, it's as weird as that sounds, um, you'll be blessed. It'll work. All right. Thanks, Nathaniel. Wait, wait, wait. Real quick, before you go, do me a favor. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell so you'll be notified with all our new content as it comes out on a daily basis. And if you're willing to support this ministry, you can do so by going to rightresponseministries.com slash donate. Thanks so much. God bless.